Hello everyone, my name is Maciej Plańczyk. I came here from Poland. Currently I work for STX Next, which is the biggest Python software house in Europe. And today I will talk about Mock and Patch, the tools that help us to create unit tests in Python. So tell me, how many of you create unit tests when you create your applications? Please raise your hand if you do. Wow, almost everyone, or maybe even everyone. And how many of you know what is mock and patch and you use mock and patch in your unit test. Please raise your hand. Great, so almost everyone. It will be much easier to talk about it when you know it already. Before I start my presentation, I would like to answer a very important question. Why are we here? We are here because I prepared 12 mojito drinks for those who will answer my questions or at least try to answer my questions. So please, during the presentation, I will have a few questions to you. Please try to answer those questions because I don't want to drink 12 mojito drinks after the presentation by myself. I want to give it to you, okay? So this is the plan for the presentation. First, I will show you a class, which will be an excuse to create some unit tests during the whole presentation. Next, I will show you a template of unit test, which will extend during the whole presentation. Then. I will tell you what is a mock and how can we use it in our unit test for this presentation. And finally, I will tell you about the patch, what it is and how you can use it in our case. So let's say a client came to us and he asked us to create an application which will receive emails and from those emails we'll take some data and then send it uh, to some endpoint using REST API. So it seems to be a very simple application to do. So we say, okay, we will do it. We take our best developers, I call them Ninja developers, and after a few days, they create a code, very good code. Probably this code will contain a class similar to this one, message sender. Message sender has send method, which takes message as an argument. From message, it takes sender, receiver, and subject. And this data is being sent in few attempts by post method from request library. Uh, actually, three attempts are done. So depending on the result from post method from re request library, uh, send method will return true or false, uh, depending on the result. So question to you, uh, what kind of unit tests would you do for this send method. And this is Wolf Mokito drink. Any ideas? Yes? Sorry? Yes, of course. Of course, uh, this is uh, very important. But uh, what other cases? Because this is basic. I think everyone would uh, create a test like this. Yes? Exactly. Post method can raise an exception, and exception, exception in this case would be raised by send method because we don't uh, catch it. So one of cases is to check if uh, exception will be raised by uh, this method. Uh, second, I think the most important thing is just to check if we really send the correct data to the correct endpoint because we use post method. So and the, the main thing that this function does is sending data to the endpoint. So first of all we should check if post method, actually if whole this send method sends correct data to correct place. But when we execute all unit tests, we don't want to send this fake test data to the real production endpoint because our client will not be happy of that. So when we check if this post method works correctly, we also should not use the original implementation of post method. So first thing, check this, but don't use the original post method. Second thing, yes, check if exception raised by post method will be raised outside of the send function. What else? We have also, yes? Yes, of course. Uh, that's something that we need to check also. Yes, of course. 
we have some logic in, in our method. The logic is that we try to send uh, data in few attempts. So I think we should also check if we really do it, if in few attempts, in case of failure, we try to send uh, this data. And last thing but not least, we have message, which is implemented somehow. So in unit test, we should cut off from the original implementation of the message. So a lot of things to do. Let's see how we can do it. This is the implementation of message class. It is very simple. It has only three fields, receiver, sender, and subject. And this is example of our unit test, which we will extend during the whole presentation. As you can see, first we create message center object. Then we get a fake message. We'll talk in a moment how we can get it. Next, we try to send it. And then we make some assertions for the result. How can we get a fake message? In this simple case, we can just implement a new class inside our unit test with those three fields, and that's all. It will work for now. But what if in a few days from now, someone will add a new field to our original message class? Or for example, and I think this is more important, someone will add a new method. Currently, there is no method inside, right? but someone will add it. Then, if we will go the path of creating our uh, new class inside of this unit test, we will need to extend it so we can fake this new method and actually also to check if this method was called correctly from the production code. This is very important. So, okay, we can do it. We'll spend some time on it. And after a few days, probably a colleague will come to us and say, wow, nice code. Let's use it in other unit tests. So we will do it. And after a few days, our Ninja developer will come and say, wow, what a great tool. Let's, let's make it public so other Ninja developers can use it. And that's when we will notice that, oh, something like this already exists. It's called mock. So first thing I want you to remember from my presentation is that if you need to pass a fake object inside your production code, and you can do it easily, like in here, we create fake message and you can easily pass it, then use mock. What is mock? I think you already know it because almost everyone said that you use mocks. So I will just shortly show it. This is how you create mock. And on mock, you can call anything, anything that doesn't exist. So if you do it, for example, not existing field, you will always get value. And if you call a method which doesn't exist, you will also get some value. This is very important because this is advantage and disadvantage, both together in one time but I will tell more about it later. So for unit tests, we don't want any value to be returned. We want some value. For example, five, like this. We can assign value that we want a mock to return with this simple line. And from this moment, this value will be always returned by a mock. This is a simple version when you can do it in one line. Okay, how can we use it in our unit test? This is very simple. In unit test, we create a mock. Next, we assign a value which we want it to return. In production code, the mock should be executed. And in unit test, back in unit test, we can make assertion if it was called correctly. In this case, our existing method was called on only once and without an argument, so we can use assert called once with. And if our method would be called with some kind of argument, we can do it with the same assertion, but we need to put the value that we expect to be called with. There are more complex cases. For example, a method was called a few times with different arguments. Then we can use assert any call. And of course, in Python documentation, you can find much more examples, which I'm not able to show you in this short presentation. I can show you just a few which I picked. For example, if we call directly a mock and then we call some methods on a mock, we can use, for example, call args list to check all the direct calls to the mock, method calls to check calls to the methods defined on a mock, or we can have all of them using mock calls. In unit tests, we can use it in assertions, but first we need to get a call object. 
and we can compare existing calls with a list of expected call objects. This is how we can use it in unit tests. So going back to our unit test, we had to create a fake message. We can do it like this. This is a method which returns a fake of our message using a mock. This mock defines receiver, sender, and subject. And this will work, at least for a few days. So any ideas why this mock isn't the best mock that we can create? And this is occasion to get a mojito drink. Spec. Sorry? Spec. Yes, almost correct. Yeah. If you change the message class, this won't reflect the change. Exactly, this is the problem. So, spec is almost what I was expecting to hear. And the best answer is, I will show it in a moment. So, what you said is that, for example, if someone will change the message class, the original message class, for example, removing the subject field, and he will forget to remove it from the production code, so it's still called in production code, then our test will fail or rise, or, or not fail. Exactly. The test will pass. Because you can call anything on a mock, even if it doesn't exist. And this is the problem. This is why we should not create mocks like this. And spets is not enough in this case. We can do much more. We can do... Ah, this is one more thing. So <laughs> I wanted to say that dragons will come in this case. Because we changed something in production code. Uh, and our unit test passed, so everything is green. So we decided, okay, we can go to the production, we can release our application, and suddenly it appears that after releasing our application doesn't work, so it's much too late. Of course, someone will say that we should use staging and other testing instances. This is just an example that we changed the code, unit test passed, but production code doesn't work. Dragons will come. Okay, so the best mock which we could create in this case is with attribute called spetset, and this will protect us from creating fakes of objects with fields or methods that doesn't exist in the real implementation, in this case, of message. But what if a message is defined like this? So all the fields are defined in init method and not on the class level. Can we use spec set in this case? Okay, we unfortunately, unfortunately cannot use spec set in this case. And this is also something that happens with response, uh, which is returned by post method. Response is defined in request library and we cannot control it, but we would like in our unit test to control the status code value. We could, use, uh, we could do it with mock, but the problem is that implementation of response looks like this. So status code is defined in init method and not on the class level. So we cannot use spec set when we want to control, when we want to create a mock of response. We need to do something else, and this is spec. So spec doesn't check if uh, what we try to create with mock, for example, the status code, exists uh, in the implementation of the real class. It, all what it does is checking if what we call from the production code was defined in the mock. So it's not the same, but we get some protection. It's not perfect, but that's what we have to do. Okay, so we already know how to mock the response. We know how to mock the message. Now, let's talk about the most important thing, how to mock the post method, because we don't want to send the test data to the real production endpoint. As I said, we should use mock when we can easily pass them to the production code. In this case, we cannot do it easily. It's somehow hard-coded. But message sender belongs to us, so we can ask our Ninja developers to change the source code. And for example, we can define sender in init method. And in our tests, we can create a mock for our sender, and everything will be fine. But what if message sender would come from some kind of library, and we cannot change it, but we still need to do this mock? So 
this is the second thing I would like you to remember from my presentation. Use patch when you cannot easily pass the fake object. Patch will solve this problem. How can we use a patch? There are different ways of using patches. I prefer using it as annotation to a test method. And this is the first option of the solution. You can say with this string what should be patched and auto spets equal true says that we want spet set attribute to be used. Patch will create a mock for this object and will pass it as an argument to our unit test. And in here we can define what should be returned uh, from our mock. Okay. And at the end of our unit test we can make assertions to our mock. There is a second option of using patch as an annotation and actually I prefer this solution because it doesn't take a string, it takes an object, at least for the first argument, and second argument can be also replaced by not string but I don't want uh, to show it on the slide because it would be a little too complex. So I prefer this solution because when I use IDE, it supports me when I do some kind of refactoring with imports and uh, other things. And in this case, IDE would help me with fixing those imports. In case of strings, it would not check anything. When you create patch, there's a very important thing that patch created, uh, the patch should be created based on the place where we call the patched method. This is something that you can forget when you create a patch for the first time. We have almost two the same codes. The code on the left we call post method from request and the code on the right we call post method from from something like message sender. Both post methods are actually the same. They come from request library. But the difference is in the way how they are called and this makes that we need to patch them differently. On the left, we patch post method from request. On the right, we patch post method from message sender. This is very important. You can forget about it when you create patches for the first time. Okay, we already know how to patch or, or maybe mock post method. So now we can go to another thing. How to make it to rise exception and to check if exception was raised. We can do it simply, of course, with a patch, and we can do it by assigning exception to a side effect attribute. And in here, we can check if exception was raised. Another thing, we have post method called a few times, if it's of course necessary, and we would like to check if we really do it in our code. So in case of failure, when we try to send the data for the first time, we would like to check if our code tries to do it next time and next time. So we need to be able to tell post method to return different things in our unit testing for different calls. For example, for first time, return failure, for second time, return failure, and for third time, return success. How can we do it? Of course, we can do it with our patch, and of course, we can do it with side effect. We just assign to side effect attribute, I mean field, a list of responses that we would like to be returned by this method. And first value from the list will be returned for the first call, second value for the second call, and so on. Sometimes we need a special implementation of our original method and nothing else can work. So in this case, we can do it. We can have our special implementation, for example, defined in our test, and we can assign it with side effect instead of original implementation of our post method. You mean this case or? Yeah, in this case, if you, you call this, uh, this mock with uh, out of spec equals true. But then in, in the body, you need uh, to give exactly the body of, of, uh, of this method or not? 
You mean arcs and quarks? Or? You are mocking post matter. Yes. And post mock. Yes. Yes. So what is the reason for using auto spec in this particular example? To check the interface and existing fields. Maybe in this example it's not the best example. Some other example would be uh, better for, for this case. Thanks. Yep. Okay, great. But if, but if you're only testing one thing at a time. Yes. Is, is that a good practice? So there are different. Uh, uh, ways for this. People say different things. It's a matter of taste. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So I think this is the next slide. Sometimes we need to create a few patches to one unit test. And this is very simple, as you can see. But you need to remember that the order of mocks which are passed to the unit test are opposite to the order of patches. Uh, which annotates this method. So first patch will return a mock which will be passed as the last one to the unit test and last patch will return a mock which will be passed as a first one to the test method. Okay, sometimes all our unit tests uh, have the same patches. So instead of repeating them all the time uh, above each unit test, we can just uh, set it on the class level. And this is very important, you need to remember about this one. Before each test, a setup method is called. And after each test, teardown method is called. Teardown is used to do some cleanup after the uh, unit test, and setup is used to prepare some environment for unit test. But people often forget that if setup will raise exception, then unit test will never be executed and teardown also will never be executed. So, if someone will set a patch in a setup method and will think that he can clean it in teardown and just after setting up a patch there will be exception raised in setup method, then the teardown will never be called. So, if we made this mistake, for example, in first unit test and we execute 1000 unit tests and 200 first unit tests is using this patch, but he, this test doesn't know that it is using a patch, it may fail, and we will spend a lot of time to find out what happened. So to solve this issue, we should not use teardown, we should use at cleanup method like this, and we will be protected from this problem. Okay, and last thing I wanted to show you, very simple, and I, I think this maybe will make you to check the documentation for mocks and patch because you can find a lot of interesting things there. How we can simply mock environment variables with just one line, like this, using patch.dict. Okay, so two things I wanted you to remember after my presentation. First thing, use mock when you can simply pass the fake object to production code. And second thing, use patches when you cannot simply pass the fake object to your production code. Any questions, if you have? Please. Yes? Uh, is there a way here to use like the actual environment and just override a uh, few keys, not uh, not only with os.environ but with any dictionary? Yes, you can do it. Please, uh, <laughs> yes, please check the documentation. You will see an example in there. Yep. Any more questions? Thank you. It's more a question like theoretical. You have some function and you want to test it and you mock stuff outside of this function and sometimes it's actually ugly. You have few mocks, you have defined side effects, you define maybe something else, you have to check mock call arcs list and other stuff like, is it 
any normal way how it's possible to make it looks better. So you or say suggestion at least. You say you have uh, a lot of mocks with a big setup with many side effects and everything in one unit test. Yes, not as, for example, three, four mocks already looks like quite a okay. lot. Okay, so first of all, try t not to do this <laughs> because it's too complex. It, it will be very hard to analyze it. So try to make it more, more simple. Yes, of course, but... But how? It depends on the code. I would have to see the code and maybe uh, there would be a solution for this. But of course, uh, not always it's possible. But okay. Okay. Any more questions? Yes? Uh, when you were mentioning the common error when patching, uh, that you need to patch the, where the name is looked up uh, from, by Python, uh, isn't that a smell that you're coupling the implementation of the thing you're patching with your tests? Basically, you need to go to the source of your library and check what they are doing, and they might be changing it in minor patches because this is not necessarily public interface, so making your code brittle. Yes, very good question. I like it very much. So this was only an example to show how we can uh, check if uh, in unit tests if exception was right. I'm not saying that uh, the code which I show you, the production code, was the best. Uh, there are different ways for this, and I think most of us will agree that we should catch this exception in our production code, in set method, and pack it with our own implementation of exception, for example, and raise this exception. And then we would catch our own exception and check this our own exception. So we are not going down to the library which we use. And I think this might be answer to your question. Am I correct? Okay. Any more questions? So I think less than 12 people were very active during my questions. So please, those people come to me and some other additional people, please come also because I have 12 drinks and I don't want to drink them. It's too much for me. Ah, one more question. <laughs> so, the, they are real drinks. I just call them mojito because it sounds funny and it's almost close to mojito, which, is, which actually they are. So there are real drinks inside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> side effects de depends on you. If, you. if you are big, then maybe side effects will not be so big. <laughs> yes, exactly. You have to test it. Thank you.